So here we are for part three of the Muncie tapes. I hope you have enjoyed parts one and two. In this part, I'm going to do sub-assemblies leading up to the final assembly of the transmission. I, I thought that I would be able to do it in three parts, but it looks like it's going to spill over into a fourth part uh, because it takes a lot of time to really do the detail that I wanted to explain in the video. That being said, I think it's coming along really good. If you have any questions, please email me. All my contact information and everything is in the show notes, which are in the video's descriptions on YouTube. So please don't write to me asking for my email address and everything when it's already there. The other thing is, is that if you have a particular transmission you would like me to rebuild on video, and you have the time, I'm more than happy to do it. I get a lot of hate mail about people saying that I don't do enough Ford units or enough Chrysler units. That's because, honestly, they don't come into my shop. If they do come into my shop, and I do have about four or five months to have it sit here while I do other work, and then I can go back and do that and do the video work, I'm more than happy to do it. So if you're thinking about asking me about doing a transmission, perhaps send me that unit and I'll work with you, okay? Again, all my contact information is there. And finally, a lot of people always ask me about wanting to buy me a cup of coffee, and I found this little cute application on the web that allows people to buy me a cup of coffee. Link is over here. Hope you like it. Let's get to this video. Thanks. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put some of this anaerobic sealant in the bore, the front bore. This way it'll seal the counter shaft through the bore it's going to set up really hard this stuff and it could prevent any additional leaks. Also, what's very good about using anaerobic sealants is that any imperfections in the bore are taken up by the sealant. You want to put it in the bore, not on the shaft, obviously, because then it'll get all over the bearings. Okay, so I got this fixture that I modified that was my T56 six-speed assembly fixture. I always like to use my bronze dimple thrust washers. These particular washers are in most of the rebuild kits now that you see around. They're steel washers. They really don't work. Do not use these in your transmission. You will really mess up the gears, okay? The bronze washers, they contain some oil. They work really well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a washer now on the front thrust surface of the counter gear. So I'll put some assembly lube on the thrust washer to keep it in place. I'm going to locate the tang of the thrust washer with the relief in the, the case here like this. That looks really good. So the front thrust washer is in place. Then I'm going to just drop the counter gear down. And through the top here, I'm going to look through the hole so I could see that it's lined up. I'll slide the rear thrust washer in place making sure that it's caught in the proper tang position. Then I'm going to push the counter gear down. Make sure the bearing access area is cleared. I take the input shaft and I drop it down like this. Everybody has their own way of doing this, but this is how I do it. Then I'll bring it back up where it needs to be. And I'll drop the counter shaft down. And I feel to make sure that it's somewhat seated where it needs to be. Now I'm holding this with my hand because I don't want to damage my fixture. So you can see here on the pin that this area is raised and it's horizontal. That's how you want it. You don't want it at an angle, you don't want it any other way, but strictly kind of horizontal across like this. Same thing, you gotta use a bronze washer for the forward thrust washer, put that in place. I'm trying to get these camera angles sort of legible for you guys because it's very hard to shoot the insides. But you put the forward reverse idler in from the inside basically get it into place. Sometimes you may have to do this to roll it into place where it is. That's good to go. 
So the cluster gear is in the case now, it's facing down. And if you want to check end play of the counter gear, meaning how much space is in between the counter gear and the thrust washer, you can use one of these simple feeler gauges. They're all over the internet, they're fairly cheap. You can get them on Amazon, Harbor Freight, or whatever. They go anywhere from, this one goes from 35 thousandths to one and a half thousandths. And you basically stick this gauge in between the thrust washer and the gear, and you can measure your end play. And since I want to do that and put the case on its side, what I'm going to do is take the reverse idler gear with the thrust washer. It takes the 30 thousandths thin washer, okay? Put that on there with the reverse idler shaft. If you have to press a pin into the idler shaft and you're using a new idler shaft, the roll pin goes equal on both sides, all right? Put that in, put it in the case. And I'm doing it this way so that I can hold everything in place and then not drop down. That's all I'm doing. This way I could take this, rotate this now 90 degrees, put it in like this. So here's our space. We got this end play here. And I'm going to go to just see what I got. Usually you want to stay under 35 thousandths, which is basically the different split, okay? You have to have oil clearance. So although this may seem like a lot, it's really not. So let's go try, let's say, uh, I don't know, 20 thousandths. We'll see how that is over here. We'll put it in here. We'll see what we got. Just out of the way. I can't even fit 20 thousandths in there. Well, just about. There you go. That's about 20 thousandths. All right. You could see how it's fitting in there. I really had to push this in here to get that. So let's do it again. You could see what I'm doing here. All right. No end play at 20 thousandths. That's roughly split into 10 thousandths aside for oil, which is perfect. Great setup. Usually I can just fit these in by just putting this in over here and catching it on the groove. I'm walking it around. So by putting the snapping on it, what I'm doing is I'm preventing the input from falling back inside of the case. When it's set up like this, what I like to do sometimes is just push my finger against this and just give it a kind of turn just to see how everything's feeling, that everything is not binding, that everything seems nice and smooth before I'm actually putting the whole transmission together. All these steps and these sub-assemblies and all these steps that I'm doing are to prevent you putting the whole transmission together and then finding out you have a problem and have to take it all apart. But this feels really nice, okay? Now we're going to flip it around, put it back to all the way again. We could take this out again. Now we're going to start working on the gear train. So I'm going to start putting together the synchronizer assemblies, and I just want to point out a few things. Seems to be a lot of confusion all the time about the hubs and the direction that they face in. If you noticed, this is the hub, this is the slider. The hubs have a protruding edge, and that protruding edge on both 3-4 and 1-2 faces towards the front of the transmission. But the long edge of the slider on 3-4 faces towards the front, yet the long edge of the 1-2 faces towards the back. All right? So 1-2 long edge faces towards the back, 3-4 long edge faces towards the front, but both hubs regardless have the protruding front edge facing towards the front. All right? So let's go look at the springs now. I just wanted to sort this out for you. These two springs are the most common springs that you see in rebuild kits that everybody's selling. It's a thin spring, it's not a bad spring, but the problem is they have a very thin edge on them that can disconnect from the key. And sometimes these springs, the edge of them could be too big so that it hits the inside wall of the hub like this, and then it doesn't even contact the key. Factory springs have these long legs on them, like this. You can see the leg is a little bit different than these. And that really prevented the spring from decoupling from the keys. And these are basically a T10 spring. That's actually a very good spring. It's got a decent leg to it, but it's thick. If you look at the, the size of the wire, it's got a little bit more th 
thicker wire to it. So it's a more robust spring. So a lot of times when I'm building transmissions, depending on the application, I might use this spring, depending on the slider being used, or my heavy duty springs. Now, on any most of my builds, I'm using the heavy duty springs. And what you do is you pick any type of key and you start by putting the key in, catching it like this, put in the next key, and then the third key. Keep in mind that that spring is attached now to this key. We're gonna use that same key, flip it over, do it in the same fashion, just like this, okay? And also, when it's in, just like this, you could see you have this nice free motion and the spring are supporting all three keys and keeping it up against the slider. So the whole thing can flow perfectly in the hub. That's what you're looking for. So now to give you an example, I'm gonna use these common springs in a lot of rebuild kits, and I'm gonna do the same thing. Put it in, wrap it around. Let's just see how this works out. You see you have this binding it's not as free as the other ones, because if you look at it, the spring is actually hitting the inside wall of the hub. It's not really a good thing. And you can see it's rough. It's not floating properly. And in fact, it's not even engaging the key fully. So, whoa. So now let's go put in the correct springs and see what we have. Also, by putting them in this fashion, just like this, you can drop the keys down if you want as well. Let's do it this another way. Let's put it in like this and just catch them. It's a lot easier than trying to put them in and slide everything over it. Okay, there you go. See how the action changes now with these springs? They're not rubbing and they're nice and smooth. That's what you're looking for. So after I have my synchronizers all together, here I got the one, two assembly, the three, four assembly, first gear, second gear, third gear up here. What I'll do is I will put the synchronizer assemblies together and match them with the gears. I'm gonna lay them on here, catch the rings and the key slots. And what I wanna do is I wanna see that they're nice and free. So what I'm doing is I'm putting pressure on it like this and I just go like this. And I wanna have a nice free motion. I want everything to be able to be free of one another. Now I'll give you an example of what happens when you have maybe a ring that's too high on a gear. This ring and gear sit way too high on one another. If I put them together like this, it binds. There's no clearance anymore in between the rings. Often this is overlooked. Sometimes you have defective cones on gears. Sometimes it's defective rings. And as a result, the unit will bind and lock up and be very hard shifting and cause extreme wear on the synchronizers very rapidly. So we, this is what we want. We want this action. This is usually only necessary for first and second. I'll put third gear with that assembly too. Make sure I can put it against it. It feels good. Put them aside. Then we're gonna work on the mid plate now. What you do is you put the snap ring in here. Some plates are already going to have them in. You don't need to take yours out. But on my billet plates, I try to have them where the snap ring really has no movement in the groove at all. There's no up and down movement in the groove. It's pretty nice and tight compared to most other plates. Spread it open like this. The bearings will usually start. Now some plates, the bearing's just gonna drop right through and 
because they're loose. The billet plates, they're a little bit tighter. But you can just work down and put some downward pressure. Usually they'll snap in like that. And there's a difference. This bearing doesn't have any lateral movement in the plate at all now. So it's all ready to go. So with the synchronizer assemblies all fitted with the gears and the mid plate all together, now we're going to just take some assembly lube. You could use any lightweight lube. In other words, I'm using, you could use this Penn's oil, synchro mesh fluid as a pre-lube or this driven synthetic assembly oil. I like using the driven oil. It doesn't allow the rings to really stick to the gears. I'll just put them on here, do this, put everything on, do all the cones. Good. Then what I'm going to do is put some lube inside the synchronizer assembly. So that's to travel down the splines, okay? Lubricates the whole assembly. It does get in there. That's the uh, driven HVL assembly lube. I like, again, using this lubricant because if the transmission is going to sit in storage for a while, the rings tend not to stick to the gears. So they tend to stay on them and break, break loose. A lot of times if you assemble them dry or with some regular oils, it may be a problem. You may also want to put some oil in the bore of the gear, just like this. Let it sit around. That's that. Now we can start assembling the main shaft. You're going to put second gear on. You're going to put the one two synchronizer assembly down. Now, these main shafts I make, the synchronizer assemblies really do not chalk on the spline. They're slip fit, but they fit really good. If you make an accurate main shaft, you don't really have to worry about press fits. You just got to make it accurately. So you can see it can slip on, but nothing is chalking this way. Next thing we're going to do now is put on the first gear sleeve. Now, some sleeves may drop right on, and you might have to use a sleeve locking compound in between the sleeve and the main shaft. The tolerances are all over the place. Some main shafts are really tight press fits and some just kind of slip on nicely. These main shafts, they tend to go on fairly good on the press, which you can, which you don't want to do, like you can just do this to just get it started with a hammer, all right? Like just kind of get in there and just tap it down a little bit with a hammer just to start it. So you never want to pound on these edges here. You just want to simply use a press and we're going to put it on the press now and press it down. Or you can heat up the sleeve and drop it down in place. So what I'm going to do is I'm holding the synchronizer assembly against the gear and I'm putting the first gear sleeve on the bearing clamp and I'm going to just press this through. That's all it is. You can feel it's going on nice and smooth. It's not binding or chattering. A lot of it has to do with using some of that assembly lube in the sleeve. You want to press it down until it's completely against the press and stops. Now what happens here is that because of the clearances in the hub, you're going to still have end play, which is what you want. So this end play is normal here. This isn't excessive end play at all. This is perfect. All right, so I'll put some lube on the first gear sleeve. And I'll slide the first gear on with the synchronizer ring. I'm doing it like this so you can see what I'm doing here. So what you want to make sure is that when you put the first gear on the sleeve that the ring is actually engaged in the keys and it's not like this bound on it. It's got to drop down into the keys. So with some main shafts when you put the rear bearing and the mid plate on it 
it may just drop down and in that case you may have to use again some sleeve locker some fits are very loose some fits are very tight usually what i'll do is i'll just check first with the punch very gently to see and this is moving down really nice it's a really slight interference fit so there's no need to really put it on the press kind of doing the same motion I did with the input shaft bearing. Again, you have to develop technique for this. If you want, use a tube over the whole main shaft. A couple of good pipes may be in order if you plan on doing a lot of builds or use a press. This is going on nice and easy. Now, some people are gonna blast me for doing this, but I've been doing it for years. If you just do it gently, you have to know a feel for this. You can't just be pounding on the bearing. Can't be doing it so that the bearing starts chipping, obviously, or denting. And obviously, when you hear that change, it's seated. A change in the sound. So the next step is to install the rear snapping that fastens the rear bearing and mid plate to the main shaft. And they come in different selective fits. You can see this one over here is thinner than this one over here. They usually range from about 75 thousandths to 100 thousandths in thickness. And what you want to do is you want to simply be able to put the thickest snapping you can in that groove. And what that does is that pulls the whole gear train back towards the bearing as tight as possible. That's important because if you have a loose snapping, what's going to happen is it's going to allow the transmission to possibly fall out of gear. So again, thickest snapping you can in the main shaft groove for the rear bearing. So here's what I want to show you. This is that 75,000 snapping, and it's really sloppy in the groove over here and this 100,000 snapping, usually most of them take the larger snapping, fits in perfect. So we're gonna put this snapping in the groove. I've also mentioned this before in videos, snapping's have a direction, okay? And you can see the way it's shaped. You wanna have the narrow part of the groove facing outwards. So in the future, let's see if you could see that there, okay? There's a difference in the groove, it kind of fans out this way. This groove needs to face towards the outside of the snap ring, not towards the inside against the bearing. That allows pliers to grab onto it easier. A lot of people, what happens is they'll tend to put the snap rings on backwards and then you won't be able to get them off if you need to. So this way you can get the snap ring off. And what I do is I just kind of push it down. I don't let the snap ring twist. There you go. Now what you could do is too is double check because sometimes there'll be burrs on the snap ring and just make sure it's tapped into the groove nicely. You're not forcing it in, just making sure it's seated good. That's all we're doing here. And that feels good. It's nicely seated in the groove. You want to inspect that, the, that it is fitted in the groove nicely, that it's not popped up anywhere. It's very important. Then simply slide on your reverse gear. Make sure it fits good, that it slides easy on the spline. Great. So let's talk about speedometer gears for a second here. If you notice, this speedometer gear is gonna be pressed onto this main shaft in this nice ground land over here. The problem is, is that these gears are very soft metal, so you don't wanna be hitting them with a punch or anything like that, or hitting them with a hammer. They get damaged quite easily. In fact, the gear that was on here, you could see it was damaged from somebody doing that exact thing. They just will bash the teeth in and ruin a good gear. So this is what happens when people use hammers and punches. This is the damage that you can get. And it was actually installed like this in this transmission. It's not cool. So look at that again. You can see what I'm talking about. Just all banged up. They're very soft. So now what we're going to do is you want to go look at the gear and you want to say, okay, if you have... This is a 27 spline extension housing. And notice again that the, the ground area is wider than the gear itself. Simple trick, if it's a driver's side speedo, the front of the ground area lines up with the front of the gear. If it's a passenger side speedometer exit, the rear of the ground area lines up with the rear of the gear like this. Very simple. You can leave a little bit if you want, like maybe about 16th of an inch, a 32nd of an inch around like this. So in other words, right about here. You don't have to really do any trick measuring. Just remember that rule. Drive aside again, front of the land to the front of the gear, passenger side, rear of the land to the rear of the gear. Now on 32 spline extensions with that fat main shaft, 
the gear lines up in the middle. So you just kind of center it in the middle. If you're running uh, a 32 spline extension housing and assembling it, that's really the only difference is where the speedometer gear goes. It'll be in the center like this on the 32 spline. So usually what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat this gear up until it ends up getting to a uh, kind of a very dark color. Usually that's going to be around 250 degrees almost, okay? Somewhere around there, anywhere between 180 to 225. It depends on how tight the press fit is of the gear. Now you can put this off and you can put it on a press, but then you got to be setting it up in the, the press and it can get really hard to do. So I just heat it up, it's a lot easier to do it that way. Now, if you want to cool it down rapidly, you can put some WD-40 on it and cool it down. And that gear is in place. So now when it comes to the front of the main shaft, do the same thing. Put some assembly lube on the shaft. Place the third speed gear in place. It spins nice. I'll put a little bit more lube on the, the cone of the gear. The ring on that. and put the 3-4 synchronizer assembly. And again, just like the 1-2 the assembly, some main shafts they'll drop on, some main shafts they may have to be pressed on. I would say about 85% of the main shafts, they will just slip right on. Now, the 3-4 synchronizer snap ring to main shaft is one size only. Again, making sure that the direction of the snap ring is correct and just put it on. That's it. So there we have the whole gear train assembled. A lot of people are asking me about end play issues. The problem is they never check end play before they take the transmission apart. So they assume when they put it together and they have some sort of end play that it's bad. It's not. This is the normal end play. Typically this end play is usually around anywhere from about 12 thousandths to say 20 something thousandths. It's quite normal. And don't forget any end play in a manual transmission the clearance is split between both sides for oil. So if you have 20 thousandths end play, it's really 10 thousandths per side. That simple. All right, so before I put the gaskets in place on this case, I just want to notice that you have a little bit of an imperfection in the casting here. I'm using this Dynatex 494.77 anaerobic gel, all right? And I'm gonna just fill in that imperfection With that sealant. The rest of the sealant I'm using simply as an adhesive just in certain spots just to hold the gasket in place. It's fine. There you go. You know, I'm just using that that sealant to kind of hold the gasket in place all right. I had come up with this idea after seeing some gaskets done on intake manifolds and the reason why I liked it because it saves a lot of time and a lot of cleanup. If you decide to use regular gaskets, just coat both sides of the gasket, a thin skin coat, in other words, over the whole gasket with this type of sealant. I never use RTV sealant because RTV sealant doesn't really dry with the absence of air. So a lot of times your clamp surfaces if you decide to put this in the car like within a few hours with RTV sealant, it's going to leak. If you have RTV sealant and you decide to use it, you know, or a similar silicone sealant, what will happen is you want to let it sit for at least a few days so that at least it's nice and dry. But normally RTV sealants, if you use them right away in an application, they will leak. So I don't recommend that. So here we are at the half hour limit and I think I should cut this video now and then we'll get to the complete assembly of the transmission in part four. We'll see how that goes. Thanks for watching and see you soon. Also again, want to buy me a cup of coffee? Here's the link. Thanks.